for the day. I think it looks really good, and I'd like to give Rose uh, some recognition for that. The seminar uh, that's going to start momentarily, I'd like to introduce Paul Anderson and his wife Rose. Uh, they're relatively new Citroen owners, and they actually live about 15 or 20 miles from here. Pr pretty, cl pretty close to what used to be the mecca of Citroen on the East Coast, which was the uh, the Citroen dealership owned by Red Dellinger is only three miles from their home. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul and Rose, and uh, I think he'll have a real informative discussion for us about his DS, about their DS. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to you all about the uh, my DS. Um, unlike a lot of you guys, I don't have a lot of history with Citroen, so maybe kind of a new perspective on my experience. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Brad. Uh, I found a good parts guy in Mechanicsburg, and he's been a great help. Uh, without Brad's help, we would not have done this. I'd also like to thank uh, Eric DeWitt. Eric, are you here? Uh, Eric DeWitt was helped me a lot getting the car over from Europe, and without his help, again, I could not have done this. And also, uh, George Dyke. I, it, George can't be with us uh, today, but he helped me. He runs the Citroen V uh, Club out of Canada, and he really put me into touch with a lot of people who were good sources for cars over in Europe. And finally, uh, Dave Burnham. Uh, Dave uh, is here. Somewhere. He's here somewhere. I think he's somewhere. Anyway, Dave Burnham, he was also a big help for me, uh, and I'll explain that in a bit and how, uh, how that worked for me. But more importantly, I'd like to thank all the owners of Citroëns that have owned them for many more years than I have. I've only owned one for about two years, but without the loyalty of a lot of the people in this, uh, to the tent here and others, there wouldn't be a support system in place for new owners of cars. So the guys that uh, and ladies that have owned them since the 70s and the 80s and 90s and later years, that's really how we can today can still practically own a, a Citroen uh, DS in the United States. So again, I thank all of you for that as well. Um, I guess I should thank my wife as well, Rose. Uh, Rose's job was to put up with me. Okay, so she knew what she, she knew she was in trouble when I asked her how to wire money to the Netherlands. That's what she knew she was that was the first I knew about. Did you respond that you thought it was a scam? <laughs> no, I, I'm like, what are you doing now? But I, was, I was shocked. As, as Brad often says, there's worse ways to spend your money. I could be going out to bars and God knows where else. So there's worse ways to spend my money. Yeah. I guess the first question I'd like to address is why someone like me, who knew nothing about these cars, ended up with one. And I mean, I knew about them as a kid. I had seen them on the road, didn't think anything of them, thought they were kind of ugly, like what most kids did. But never really thought about much of it until back in 1989, uh, Rose and I were in the market for property in, in the potential Pennsylvania. So I'm driving down Route 382. In the middle of frickin' nowhere, excuse my French, so to speak, middle of nowhere is a Citroën dealer of all places in Lewisbury, Pennsylvania. I had no idea why it was there. I had no idea the history. The sign was out there. There was, you know, a dozen cars along the, along the road and probably, what, a hundred down the field, probably? And I'm thinking, that's kind of weird. Why would that dealership be there? So I kind of put it out of my mind. And then the next thing that really, um, really brought uh, Citroën to my mind was about four years ago I got a, a little brochure in the mail for a, an automotive book. So I'm kind of a gearhead. I have a couple other antique vehicles and one of the books that was that was, wrote, that was advertised for sale is one by uh, John Reynolds. It's called the Classic Citroëns and it covers the traction, it covers the, uh, the DS, it covers the 2CV, the HY band, and also I believe the CX. And for those of you who don't have that book, it's an excellent book. Actually, let me get out of the car. I have it in the car. Really, really, really hard to find. I found one today and I paid the price for it. You have to try to Amazon. It's out of print. That's one of the real things. Lots of great activities.
Apparently this book is still in print. For those of you who don't have it, it's an absolutely fantastic book. Oh, it's not in print anymore? It's not. They just bought one today. Okay, but if, if you can find this book and don't, and don't have it, you should really get it. It's, it's a fantastic book. It's really the story, it's really the story of the Michelin years of, of Citroën from 35 to 75. And just a, a great overall history. Another book that I picked up later, and I believe this one is out of print, it's called The Original Citroën Day S. It's also a very good resource book on all the different models and permutations of the car. Over the over 20 years, they had many, many different variations on the vehicle. And this is a great overview as well. So really, I think this book got me back interested in the vehicles. That was about four years ago I picked this up, I bought this. And then about three years ago, I think, I uh, stopped here on the show, I think in 20, 2012. And a, a man in a white Citroën from Day um, from, I think it was near Buffalo. I don't remember the guy's name, but he was kind enough to let me drive his. And that's all it took. As Rose said, I came back that day from the car show, and all I could do was talk about this crazy car that I found in, you know, at the car show, and, and she knew she was in trouble. So that's, that's kind of my, um, how I kind of got interested in them and how I ended up buying one. Um, and for me also, it's a technological appeal. I mean, there's so many advanced features on these cars that are just so revolutionary. I'm an engineer by education. I, I work in manufacturing, and just some of the things that they're able to accomplish with this car also may be very interested in getting one. So the next step in my process was really deciding what did I want to get. Like I said, there's many different versions of the car. There's the Day S, there's the ID, there's different different uh, engine, engine, engine displacements. There's the old three main bearing engine, the new five main bearing engine. There's different types of fluid that are used, the old brake fluid cars or the, the green fluid cars. And I, I, after studying the Reynolds book for quite some time, I decided I want something pretty specific. I wanted, to I wanted a third nose. Okay, the, the third design in the front end, but I wanted a Euro spec car so it had the turning headlights and the self-leveling headlights. Then I got really specific and I said, well, I want the old style dashboard. So if you want those two things, okay, that narrows you down to just two years. 68 with the, with the earlier version of the old style dashboard, not the second version, I guess. And then the 69 is a one year only dashboard that has a sloping dash like the 68, but the dashboard's all black. So I, I thought the old dashboard was very attractive, so I said, third nose, Euro spec, uh, an old style dash. So that narrowed it down to two years. And then the, uh, the cars were either available with a four speed manual on the column, a five speed later manual on the column, or what's called the Citromatic. And I, I decided I wanted the Citromatic because I read a lot about the Citromatic. It is kind of scary technology, but from what I had read, when it works, and it works tremendously well. So I decided I want the, what they call in French, the uh, BBH, and part by French, but it's uh, Watt Vitesse Hydraulique or something like that, okay? Which basically means hydraulic gearbox. And it's a really interesting system that's a four-speed manual, but there's no clutch pedal. And the hydraulic system, the hydraulic control mechanism, uh, selects the, uh, uh, releases the clutch, selects the next gear, re-engages the clutch as you move the shift wand between the gears. And it's really a, a novel system and properly set up, it works fantastic. So I, I knew I wanted a BBH. I wanted the Palace option with the upgraded interior, the upgraded trim. And this was probably an almost impossible thing, as it turned out. I wanted a rust-free one, okay? And here's the car that was designed back in the late 40s, early 50s. Well, cars of that era, even if they were body on frame, were rust buckets. And unit body construction cars, which this car is, were also very prone to rust damage. So you don't want a car, I didn't want a car that would have to learn how to weld and buy parts and, and try to do all that stuff. That's, that's not my talent. I don't have the talent for that. As far as the interior, I didn't really care whether it was leather or cloth. The, a lot of the Palas have leather, but not all of them. <laughs> One thing I didn't get, which I wanted, was the uh, the Edison Continental radio, but it turns out they're extremely hard to find and extremely expensive, so I, I gave up on that. 
The other thing, if you're considering buying a, a DS, is the, 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 the fluid that drives, it's in the hydraulic system. The earlier cars, I think there were two versions of brake fluid, uh, it was like a vegetable oil-based system, and then brake fluid, I think. And then I think in, in 1966, for Eurospec cars, they converted to what's called LHM fluid, which is uh, stands for a liquid hydraulic uh, mineral. mineral, I guess, yes, LHM. And it's that characteristic green color. That's why when you open the hood on any of the later late model uh, DS, all the hydraulic components are painted green because you don't want to mix the old fluid with the new fluid because it'll destroy the system effectively. Well, if I interject, one of yeah. the one of the odd things about it is the original fluid, which is called LHS2, which was liquid hydraulic synthetic, which yeah. is synthetic hydraulic fluid, um, was red in color. And with the, the green fluid, the LHM cars, that fluid was compatible with, with um, chemically with automatic transmission fluid, which is red in color. Oh, okay. Now, there are, I, I don't think you'll ever see uh, a, a brake fluid, what we call a brake fluid car, with the actual red fluid in it. It's very rare. It's very hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> it's just an interesting yeah. side to me. I mean, I've heard people say that the old uh, uh, brake fluid cars ride better. I really don't know that. I mean, the ride quality in an LHM car is so fantastic. I can't imagine it could be any better, but... It's all a matter of damping. Yeah, okay. They, they, were, they were more softly damped. But I think for buying a, a DS, if you're a novice like I am, an LHM car makes a lot more sense. I mean, I, I rebuilt the, uh, the, uh, the rear brake cylinders, and after 45 years on the vehicle, they were in perfect condition except the ovens were worn. And you would never find that even on a, any other car. I mean, so the, the LHM being a, a pure hydraulic fluid preserves everything, and as it leaks out of everywhere, it also <laughs> covers everything in a fine coating of, not really a fine coating, a thick coating of grease and dirt, so it kind of helped preserve the car. And Rosa will attest to the uh, number of pairs of dungarees I threw out that were saturated in, in grease and, and oil. So LHM would be a good move for for um, uh, for a, a new a new owner of a DS uh, in the United States, the American spec cars didn't become uh, LHM until halfway through, I think 1969. So you have to take that into consideration when you are looking for a car. You always want to go, I think, with an LHM car, at least to start. Anyway. Could I interject there? Yeah. I'll give a bit of tidbit. The, the reason the cars in the United States had the vegetable-based fluid, which was LH2. Yeah. LHS2 until 1969. Citroen changed in Europe in 1967. So, but okay. it took two and a half years for our boneheaded government <laughs> to be proven that a mineral based fluid could be used in a brake system without having problems because of the boiling issues and yeah. all that. Yeah. So that is why Citroen tried to bring it in here earlier, but our government would only allow it starting in about the middle of 69. Actually, the government had a surprising role in some other aspects of the history of the car in the United States. The U.S. spec cars, back I think in 1966, this didn't affect Citroën yet, but back in 66, I think it was, glass covered headlights became illegal in the United States. I also own a 63 Volkswagen, a Beetle. And it has glass covered headlights, a seal beam bulb with glass cover over the top. If you look at a 66 Volkswagen, you'll find that you have an exposed seal beam. That's because the government outlawed glass covered headlights in their infinite wisdom. So that's why when you look at an American spec third nose car, I think there's a blue one down there with a white roof. That has the exposed seal beam because that's all they allowed in the United States. It was it was protectionism. It was the, the U.S. manufacturers could have very well been. Yeah, the U.S. manufacturers didn't. They didn't want to go to the expense of manufacturing the non-sealed beam, the, the halogen style right. headlights, um, because they're more you know, they, they would have driven their costs up. And they also didn't want the, Euro <laughs> the, the European manufacturers having an edge in aerodynamics and all this other stuff. Yeah. So anything anything that would have been to the advantage of, of the European manufacturers, the U.S. manufacturers pressured the DOT to outlaw essentially. Um, the other thing that, about the, the brake fluid conversion over to LHM is the DOT argued with Citroen that if it's powering the brakes, it has to be it has to use brake fluid. Oh, and yeah, Citroen says brake. Yeah. pointing out that, that they that they allow aircraft to use mineral fluid yeah. for their brakes. Yeah. <laughs> and that was one of the arguments that, that, that finally so forced the issue. 
DOT policy. The other thing, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Brad, but I think the reason why Citroën pulled out of the states is because in 1973, the bumper laws came out, okay? And part of the bumper regulation, if I remember correctly, is that the bumpers had to match when cars hit each other. Well, you can't do that on one of these because, what, the ride height changes. Okay, so that basically killed off well, it was the brand. Of the cars. If, exactly. Now, if you uh, if you walk through the show field and you see American spec cars, just about every manufacturer in 1973 went to some kind of a rubber bumper instead of a chrome one because it was an issue of a certain amount of mile per hour impact without damage. And Citroen, you have to remember. Citroen was only two years away from a full remake and a switch over to the CX model. Right. So for Citroen to have redesigned their front and rear bumpers for the very small number of cars they were selling in the United States for only two years of production run would have been very cost prohibitive. So I'm sure that that, that was probably the major reason they They weren't selling a lot of cars in the States anyway, so well, it makes economic sense to make a U.S. Yeah. version with U.S. bumpers and all my, that. My understanding is they were also, they were also playing that this 5 mile per impact absorption criteria was ridiculous. And they were and they were proven right, because the front bumper impact requir uh, absorption requirement today is 2.5 miles yeah, per hour. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, right. And 1 mile uh, per hour in the, the rear. The other thing that's very obvious, I, I actually worked at a dealership at that time, uh, believe it or not. Uh, the French were not terribly great at marketing to the United States <laughs> because the French were of the were of the thought process that they made the best car and if the United States didn't like it, tough crap. And and the dealers for years were begging Citroën to put automatic transmissions and, and all the things that were missing in a luxury car that you could get on a Chevy in the United States and the French said like, we're going to change our things for one country? These were not inexpensive cars. I mean, they were expensive cars, and the vast majority of Americans weren't looking for a expensive, relatively smaller car, at least on the outside. Manual transmission, four cylinder. They wanted a big V8, an automatic, and air conditioning, and that's what they wanted. So they got, it didn't have a lot of appeal in the, in the United States. The DS21 Palace sold for about $6,000. That's expensive in that era. Very expensive. It's almost as expensive as a Cadillac LA. So let me let me transition now into how did I find that car? How What was the process I, I went through to, to buy it? And what I found early on in the, in the conversations is that the, the Citroën community is a very close-knit group. Everybody seems to know everybody else. Uh, there's a lot of respect for each other. And because of that, a lot of really good, a number of good uh, places you can get a car and be able to buy a car overseas and, and trust you're going to get something good. I never actually saw that car until it was delivered to my house. Okay, I bought it sight on scene, not quite that way, but I never actually saw the car physically. I saw plenty of pictures of it, but I never saw the car until it arrived at my house. What I did is I reached out to, I think it was first uh, Brad and then uh, George Dyke. And I asked them if I wanted to buy a car, you know, first off, what would be a good budget price for a nice one? And also, secondly, where would I go? Okay, what, who could I trust overseas that I could buy a car without actually having to travel to Europe and assess it? And by the way, it wouldn't do me any good to see it anyway because I have no idea what I'm looking at. So, and that's the bottom line. You know, I can read the book and all that, but it only helps so much. So, uh, I came up with a, a, a list of people that I reached out to. Eric DeWitt was one. Andre Pohl in the Netherlands was one. Uh, Garage Timmer is one. Uh, uh, Rob Timmer over in uh, the Netherlands. And also in England, there's one called the uh, French Classics. And they still have a lot of really nice cars for sale. Uh, but those are the four that I, that I reached out to. I think it was a fifth one. I can't remember the name. But he actually knew I had already asked somebody else because everybody <laughs> knows everybody. So, so it didn't take long for word to get out. There was some crazy guy in Pennsylvania who wanted a, uh, a Citroen. <laughs> Was it a Timmer? A Garage Timmer. Oh, garage T I M M E R. I can give you an email for them and all that. Okay. That's who I actually ended up buying it from. I dealt, so I, over, over a course of maybe six months or so, I had different cars, pictures sent to me from uh, by Andre, by Rob at Garage Timmer. 
Uh, the first one I got, picked this up from uh, Rob, it was a really nice one. One actually I think was better than this car. It was a blue one, a uh, one owner, beautiful car. And finally, I guess the owner's wife got said, oh, I don't want to sell it. Okay, so if I hadn't been for that, I would have had a blue one with a white roof. Okay, but that's the way things work out. But eventually he ran across this car. This car came from southern France. And again, pardon my language skills in the uh, Haute-Garonne region of France. Does that sound roughly right? Hopefully. And that's near the uh, Spanish border. It's a very dry, arid area. Uh, so it was a car that was not exposed to a lot of bad weather. Uh, so the process I went through is I had um, uh, Rob Timmer take probably 200 pictures of the car. I asked, I did a lot of research online. There's a, there's a lot of different websites out there, and there's there's one uh, a website based out of California. Uh, do you know what it's called? Um, Citroen, uh, Citroen Concourse, and they have a really good buyer's guide out there, and they tell you what things to look for on a, on a DS. So I made a list of, of things that I wanted Rob to take pictures of, and he cooperated really well. He he took the fenders off, he lifted up the carpet, he put it off on a lift or on, on, a, on a pit. Took pictures of all the areas under the hood. I probably had about uh, 200 pictures. It became, became kind of a hassle because I did this all at work, okay, so don't tell anybody. <laughs> Carport, right? Right, exactly. But our firewall at work only allows a 10 meg file to come across the internet. So we had to, I, he had to send me photos two at a time, 200 photos. So. Oh, uh, I, I think get in trouble on that. But um, he sent lots of pictures, but again, being a novice, the pictures don't do me a lot of good except to say that's a nice car. So I, I recruited uh, Dave Burnham. He's up in uh, near Albany, North of Albany in New York. Uh, very well known in the community as an excellent mechanic uh, of these cars. Runs a great shop. I've been to his place since. And I said, I called up Dave Asbel and said, hey Dave, boy, can I hire you to evaluate pictures? And he was kind enough to agree to that. And Carter, I think you were involved in that as well. You were probably dragged into that. And um, I sent him pictures, you know, probably about 50 pictures, picked out the ones that